The next thing I want to talk about is rotations. We got our estimates for L, but notice that there can be infinite different representation for L and F due to orthogonal projections. So suppose U is a M by M orthogonal projection such that U times U transpose is equal to U transpose time U equal to the identity matrix. Then we can take this model that we have and add U times U transpose here, basically add the identity matrix here, which is what I did here, and then separate it and call this thing L tilde and this thing F tilde. And yeah, we got basically the same model only with a different representation, different L and different F. What this means, it means that any factor analysis solution is indeterminate. There is no one solution. There's an infinite number of solution and L and F are only determined only up to an orthogonal matrix projection. So if you have some solution for L and F, you can take any U that you want that is an orthogonal projection, for example, uh, rotation, multiply L on the right side, multiply F on the left side with the transpose, and you get another solution, which will explain the data exactly the same. So this property gives justification for the ability to rotate uh, the L matrix in order to make more sense of these factors. And what do I mean by make more sense? Well, ideally, we would want the variables be associated with different distinct factors. So let me give an example. Suppose I have six variables and two factors, and I found the L matrix, and it's this matrix over here. Okay, this representation makes it a bit hard to understand what each factor does. So the first factor just looks like a mix of all the variables. And the second factor looks like it's contrasting the first three variables with the last three variables, but you don't really understand what they are doing. Now, if we would look at the variables as data points and the factors as the axes and rotate the data points by 45 degrees, the picture will become much clearer. So I'll use this rotation matrix. Uh, this will be our U. And after multiplying by it, uh, we will get the LU or the L tilde matrix, and it looks like this. And now it makes a bit more sense, right? So here we have large coefficients that seems to group the first three variables and very small coefficients for the other variables. So we would say that one factor groups the first three variables. And here we have exactly the opposite. The other factor groups the last three variables. And geometrically, it would look like this. Yeah, so these are the points and the original axes are the original representation that we have in the with the L matrix. After rotation, it's as if I rotated the points or alternatively, I could say that I rotated the axes. And so now these are my new axes. Yeah, so this is my, so this is my new factor one and this is my new factor two. And now we can see that one factor groups these three variables and another factor groups these three variables. How do you find these rotation matrix or how do you choose these rotation matrix? There are different methods. One of the famous method is called Varimax, but I will discuss this in a future video. There's also something called oblique rotations, which are non-orthogonal rotations. This corresponds to basically a different model, a non-orthogonal model, where I don't assume that the variance of F is the identity matrix. I assume it's some uh, correlation matrix. So I assume there is some correlation between the factors and if I assume that, I can also do different transformations and not just this orthogonal transformations. Okay, there are three more issues I want to cover in this video. One is covariance versus correlation. So you can do factor analysis as well as PCA on the covariance matrix and on the correlation matrix, which is just the covariance of the scale data. The results will be a bit different. So what should you do? It's a bit of a controversial topic. There is no clear-cut answer, but generally there seems to be an agreement that if your data is more or less on the same scale, you should use the covariance matrix, at least if you think that the variance of the original variable is important. If the data is on different scales, then here it's pretty obvious that you should scale it or use the correlation matrix because you wouldn't want high variance in a certain variable that is measured in millimeters to dominate the model and the calculations over another variable that is measured in meters. Yeah. So note though that by using the correlation matrix, you could be losing some important information.
On the upside, if you use the correlation matrix, it's usually a bit easier to interpret the communalities and the uniqueness because their values are always relative to one. Yeah. So uh, if I use the correlation matrix, the capital row is equal to this. If I look at the diagonal, I have one equal to this plus this. And if I look at the off diagonals, then this thing can only be between zero and one. And yeah, it makes it a bit easier to uh, look at these models. Not that much. I mean, if you use the covariance, then instead of one, you will have some sigma square value, so some scalar value, but still sometimes it's a bit easier. Another point to make is that factor analysis doesn't always give proper solutions. So there could be some extreme cases where the solutions are impossible. This is the example given in chapter nine of the multivariate analysis book. So suppose this is our covariance matrix in this case, because the diagonals are one, it's also the correlation matrix. And suppose I'm hypothesizing that there is only one factor. So M is equal to one. Using the model that we have, this is the covariance matrix. It's equal to L times L transpose, which is this, plus the psi matrix, which is this. Luckily for us, in this case, we have six equations with six variables because, because of the symmetry. Yeah, So we don't need to look at both uh, of diagonals, we could just look at the upper diagonal. So we have six equations with six variables. We can solve it analytically. If we solve it, we get, for example, that L11 is equal to this thing and that Psi1 is equal to this thing. Now, why is this problematic? There's two reasons why is this problematic. First is that this thing is supposed to be a correlation. So we said that the covariance of X and F is the L matrix. It's also a correlation because here, the variance of X is one and the variance of F is also one. So it's a correlation, but correlation can be bigger than one. So this doesn't make any sense. Also, we said that this thing is the variance of epsilon one. And so variance can't be negative. So again, this solution is improper and it makes no sense. We cannot decompose this matrix into just one factor. We need more factors. Maybe we need two, maybe we need three. Okay, so this could happen. And so not every hypothesized model that the researcher thinks and says, oh, I can maybe squish down this 100 variables to just two factors. Could be that no, could be that the solutions that you get doesn't make sense. And maybe if you add more factors, then it would make sense. The last point I wanna make is that factor analysis is sometimes more of an art than a science. It's very subjective. The researcher is usually looking for reasonable explanations and the criteria for deciding if the analysis is correct or not is what chapter nine of the multivariate analysis book calls the why criterion. And I just like this quote, so I will quote from it. If while scrutinizing the factor analysis, the investigator can shout, wow, I understand these factors, then the application is deemed successful. So yeah, so factor analysis is a bit more of an art than science. We are looking for some reasonable explanations that can explain the data and that makes sense with our domain knowledge in psychology, economy, etc. So this is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next one.